first introduce Imogen and then also John himself. Uh, Dr. Imogen Wiltshire is an art historian specializing in modern and indeed contemporary art based at the University of Leicester. Um, as a postdoctoral research fellow, I think I've got that right, haven't I, Imogen, or are you already <laughs> beyond that? I think that that's correct. Um, good. Her research and teaching interests are absolutely fascinating. They lie especially in the visual arts, health and medicine, the relationship to the visual arts, feminism, migration, exhibition histories, and art pedagogy. Her PhD in the history of art at Birmingham University included a chapter on the subject for tonight's event, namely Arthur Segal, um, but formed part of a bigger project, uh, which is being turned, as we speak, I believe, into a book with the following title, Art Therapy and Modernism in 20th Century Britain and the United States as well. Fascinating topic indeed. So Imogen, we look forward to be kept, being kept informed about its, its, its progress. Um, John, I'm just wondering whether to introduce you now, perhaps I will, and then we can hand over to you seamlessly after Imogen has given her talk. John, as I've already indicated, is the grandson of Arthur and the son of Walter Segal. And to quote him, uh, almost verbatim, he's pointed out that he's taken a very different path in life from his grandfather and his father. He studied chemistry in London and then Cambridge and has a science background. However, as he put it, he grew up with the architect's work, namely his father's, and the painting school set up by his uh, grandfather, and indeed grandmother as well, prominent and ever present. And uh, he'll follow Imogen uh, to say something in a more personal way, obviously, inevitably, and interestingly, about his grandfather's life in particular. Lovely, so over to you, Imogen, um, and thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Great, thank you so much, Monica, for the introduction um, and for organizing the event. So I'm just going to share my screen, just bear with me. Hopefully you can see that okay? Uh, yes, all good. Okay, great. Um, so what I'm gonna be talking about then is Arthur, Ernestine and Marianne, that's husband, wife and daughter. And I'm focusing on the private painting school that they established together in Britain in 1936. So I'm starting then uh, with this photograph, which was taken in 1940 in Oxford. So on the left of the image is Arthur, who was an artist and an art teacher. You can see in the image he's posed as though offering tuition to the student who's sitting in the foreground at an easel. She's holding a palette and a brush posed looking down as though um, in the act of painting. So this is quite a kind of highly constructed image with a careful choice of composition. It's deliberate in what it's um, showing us. So it's not a kind of straightforward form of documentation, but it nonetheless tells us something about um, the painting school and its approach. So the photograph then is arranged so we can see that the students um, completed or near completed painting is of a naturalistic looking still life. We can see a vase here placed on a dark cloth. Um, from the way that it's painted we can see um, that there's a strong interest in the rendering of light and shades to present the three-dimensionality of the object. And then in the background, we can see other works on the wall, which are also probably by students. So other portraits here, another still life, and a representation here of a wooden uh, mannequin. So as this image implies, the school taught students to paint figurative subjects from life naturalistically by focusing on light, form, and color. And this was rooted in what Arthur called the objective principles of painting, which was a framework that he devised during the 1920s um, in Berlin. Um, and we'll come back to the kind of art historical implications of that shortly. So this image then was taken in Oxford in 1940. So Arthur, Ernestine and Marianne arrived in London in 1936. They fled from Berlin in 1933, where the family had been really involved in avant-garde modernist circles. They first fled to Mallorca where they lived for three years before having to leave again and, come, and then kind of after that they uh, arrived in Britain. Um, so they opened the first painting school in Bloomsbury. Then at the outbreak of the war they moved to Banbury Road in Oxford temporarily in the early 1940s which was um, where this photograph was taken and then they relocated um, back to London 
So that's a kind of introduction then. And what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk is give quite a broad overview of the painting school. I'm going to discuss the family's approach to art making. So what they taught and how they understood the artistic process. And I'm going to focus especially on Arthur's work in the then nascent field of art therapy. And I'm also going to look at the mechanisms by which the family established themselves socially and professionally, the difficulties that they faced as refugees, and I'm also going to reflect um, on the kind of wider contributions that they made to art education and therapeutic care in Britain. Now, one thing that I want to stress from the beginning is that the painting school was a family venture. So Arthur was an artist, he produced paintings that are, of course, attributed to him. He authored several texts. He devised the painting principles. The school was named after him. So I'm showing you here on the left two archival uh, documents. The first one is from Oxford and the, the one below is from their kind of previous painting school in Berlin. And they're both of which are named after him. But what I want to emphasize is that Ernestine and then later Marianne had really central roles. So they were both involved in the teaching and developing the social stance of the school. And Ernestine in particular worked tirelessly in an administrative capacity. And one thing that comes through the archive material relating to the school is the difficulty that the family had in one sense in establishing themselves in Britain. But more than this, what I thought kind of comes through the material are the efforts of Ernestine in making and fostering new contacts, in publicizing, in organizing exhibitions, in attracting new students, writing letters and petitions, in record keeping, organizing the finances, all of which she did to kind of help establish them socially and um, professionally. Now, Arthur sadly died in 1944, and after that, she kept the school running and helped to secure a legacy for him as an artist, which our historians have started to kind of pick up on in more recent years. So I think it's important to emphasise Ernestine from the start, not only because she had a kind of key role in this particular case study, but her work also belongs to what is the sometimes more overlooked, less visible labour, often undertaken by women, perhaps historically, and wives, which are not always type, part of the type of art history that focuses on the kind of lineage of men artists. Now, you might have noticed that the title or the name of the school is um, professionals and non for professionals and non-professionals. Now, as this suggests, the school taught professional artists or students who became artists later and amateurs who attended because they were interested and they, they liked painting, for example. So the student, the school rather received students who were both adults and children as private students during the day and in the evening. And a high proportion of the attendees in Britain were amateurs. So the historical narratives then that I'm kind of presenting here are not especially about big, known, named, famous canonical artists. So there were some famous attendees, but I think an interesting aspect of the school is precisely its attitude towards amateurs and non-professionals, which has an important art historical and social context that we're going to come back to. So painting at the school then, it was rooted in the system that Arthur devised, and he became increasingly preoccupied at the end of the 1920s with naturalism. So he wrote um, a manifesto for naturalism, in Berlin in 1931 and wrote a version in English later, We Copy Nature, that was published uh, in 1944. And in this text, he claimed, and I, I quote from the text, we intend to represent nature more objectively than has been done until now, end quote. Mm. So his principles then were based on the view that artworks should represent objects in space by means of light, form and colour. So the priority then was to show students how objects are constructed by light and he encouraged them to do this by exploring 
kind of tonal properties of light and shade. So one exercise, for example, that the students did was use using paint to sketch out the light and dark elements of model objects in monochrome rather than drawing them, for example. So the point of this was to think about the borders of different tones and shifting planes of colour. Um, so I'm showing you another photograph here of Arthur. Here he is standing, looking at the camera. And we can see in this image other still life paintings on the wall, as well as several portraits. And then on the left here, um, this arrangement of dark glass bottles lined up on the table on the left hand side, further showing that they were interested in um, arranging and painting still life subjects. Students then didn't paint imaginative scenes. So the interest was not for Arthur, not on producing artwork that was concerned in his words, and I quote, with an inner self without any relation to the outside world. So emphasis was on visual modes of representation, how three dimensional objects are constructed by light and how paint can be handled and applied in order to, to translate this into a two dimensional representation. Now his shift towards naturalism in the late 1920s can also be seen in his own artworks that he produced, as well as in um, his teaching methods. Um, now Arthur had occupied a central position in modernist circles in Germany from the 1910s through to 1933. And this is reflected in the different kinds of work that he produced. Now I'm not gonna go into this in detail and I know that um, John is gonna show you some interesting works in his talk, but just to say that Arthur worked in an expressionist idiom. He was part of the new secession in Berlin. He produced woodcuts and he was also part of the Dada movement during the First World War. Now, during the 1920s, he experimented formally with the form and surface of painting. So I'm showing you here an example of a landscape painting. And you can see in this work, he's divided the entire composition into regular squares with the boats, houses and mountains of the scene um, simplified here as geometric shapes. So there's an overall flattened surface Elements of the landscape are created by strong gradations of colour, and you can see that the image is also extended onto the outside frame of the painting. Now, in the late 1920s, then, he began to reject this more experimental approach to form and representation, and began to produce work that adhered to more conventional rules of perspective, and that represented objects in a more illusionistic way. So these are some examples of later paintings um, from the 1930s, um, which um, are less formally innovative in their representation of still life subjects. Now this shift in his work can be situated more widely art historically. So interestingly, Arthur himself claimed that this naturalism, this way of painting was universal, that it was timeless, that it was detached from avant-garde experimentation. And he claimed these principles as something that transcended fashion and transcended trends in contemporary art. So we can see in these works that there is an attempt to reject modernist exploration of space, form and perspective. It's more illusionistic. But I would also argue though, that his approach to painting at this time was not as kind of universal and timeless as he claimed, but that actually it was developed in um, and was a response to the specific cultural context of Weimar Berlin. So at this time in the 1920s, there was generally um, a rejection of the perceived subjectivity of pre-war, uh, pre-First World War expressionism. So Kandinsky um, kind of exemplifies in many ways aspects of, of expressionism with bright colours, distortion, collapsing of perspective, areas of abstraction in these works. And Kandinsky really emphasised um, the spirituality of art and its relationship to an inner being, 
And then after the First World War, many artists rejected this kind of expressionism. So there was a broad shift in Germany, France and Italy after the First World War towards figuration and towards illusionistic appearances in art. So in Germany, this shift took the form of what's called Neue Sachlichkeit or new objectivity. And this encompassed a range of tendencies, but in general, the style is often characterized as quite matter of fact um, and unsentimental uh, and with an interest in the objective representation of material realities of contemporary life. And as I said, a kind of rejection of the spiritualized subjectivity and abstraction of expressionism. So I'm just showing you here two examples. So while um, expressionism makes brushwork visible, these works try to hide it. So there's a tendency here to produce smooth surfaces. There's a truth to the outline of objects. There's a focus on perspective and static compositional structure. So I think that uh, Arthur's shift um, and his objective principles can be understood as being informed by the visual vocabularies of Neue, Neue Zaklikait. Um, and the Raoul Hausmann, um, who was a Dadaist who um, Arthur was friends with, criticized expressionism for its emotionalism and for being non-objective. So I think that Arthur took this on explicitly in the formation of his objective principles. And so his methodical examination of the optical construction of three-dimensionality is a response and part of a broader reaction against pre-war trends. So all of this is to say that his approach looks quite conservative and looks out of step with what we understand to be modernist practice, but I think it's not that far outside contemporary trends or it's not as far outside contemporary trends to the extent that he claimed that it was. And that this, these principles can be positioned within a modernist figurative tradition that sought to reject expressionism. Now, the main um, philosophy of uh, the school in Britain was that everybody could learn to paint. So Arthur had explored and promoted the learnability of painting in Berlin before 1933. So during the late 1920s and into 1930s, he published articles and gave interviews and talks on this topic. So to this end in Britain, they fostered what was termed the non-professional branch of the school. And this was underscored by the corresponding set of principles for painting that, as we've seen, were intended to provide an objective and learnable basis. So the painting principles then offered methodical instruction, advising in detail how kind of hard aspects of a painting should push forward and be in the foreground, whereas softer parts uh, should recede. And I'm showing you here at the bottom um, an extract from an exhibition catalogue for one of the school's exhibitions. And it might be a bit small for you to see, but it's all the exhibitors are listed by name and according to the duration of study. So this category here, this is just an extract, is lists students who have had between six to 12 months of study. And then it lists more specifically, for example, 11 months and for three days weekly. And this way of organizing the information then is quite unusual for a catalogue and seems again to stress the learnability of painting and the idea that improvement could be achieved through sequential lessons. Now, the family's idea then and convictions about everyone being able to participate in art making were broadly in line with progressive education and especially child-centered approaches to learning that were developed in Europe and in the US in the early 20th century. And the most famous exponent of this is, is Franz Cizek, who is credited with initiating the child art movement in Vienna in the early 20th century. So Cizek's approach centered, at least in theory, on encouraging children to engage in spontaneous forms of art making. So the idea was fostering free expression in art as opposed to more structured teaching was a way to unleash 
children's inherent creativity. So the seagulls painting approach practically is clearly really different to this. So it wasn't about imaginative, open, free expression, but it's about a controlled formulaic process leading to naturalistic forms as we've seen. But the ideas that are underpinning this about cultivating individual potential and accessing art were broadly in line with um, contemporary reform pedagogy. And indeed a really important part of the school's identity was its conviction about the social function of art. So the seagulls defined art not only as a static object on a wall in a gallery, but as a process that is undertaken and that can be undertaken beneficially. So in one text, um, Arthur wrote, um, for example, and this is a quote from the text, um, painting activity should not be considered a reserved occupation for the few, but a whole community, but for the whole community as a social factor and as a means of education, recreation and rehabilitation. Now, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but in brief, the origins of this idea of art as a process and one that's beneficial lie in the 19th century with the arts and crafts movement. So John Ruskin, William Morris helped to conceptualize art making and the production of objects by hand as broadly restorative and ameliorative. And one consequence of this is that there was a huge growth in the amateur take up of arts and crafts as hobbies at the end of the 19th century. And this continued to grow hugely in the 20th century with non-professional art making happening in schools, in homes, in prisons, in community centers. And obviously this is something that still happens on a big scale today. So the Seagull's emphasis then on amateurs belongs to a much bigger history of non-professional art practice, which at the moment doesn't really have a kind of prominent place in art history. Now, the way that the school promoted art as an inherently enriching and psychologically beneficial activity, and one that in theory anybody could participate in, established the groundwork for a really interesting and historically interesting, uh, significant rather, aspect of the school, um, which is that it developed an early form of art therapy. In 1937 then in London, Arthur began to practice and theorize how his principles could be used therapeutically. So he stated that art had psychotherapeutic possibilities and he began to put this into practice, giving lessons to adults and children for psychological purposes. He engaged the interest of psychiatrists and psychoanalysts, some of whom referred their patients to the school. So Margaret Lowenfeld, for example, who some of you might have heard of as the influential child psychotherapist, sent two patients to the painting school. And she reported in 1938 that she was, quote, particularly pleased, end quote, with um, the cases that the artists had been working with. Um, I'm showing you here at the bottom um, uh, extract from an exhibition catalogue. So the school ran what were called special doctor courses uh, which began in 1938 in order to teach methods, the painting methods to psychotherapy professionals. So the objective of this program was to allow students to learn and experience his um, approach to art through participation. So I'm showing you here exhibition catalogue and it's again it's probably too small for you to see but it's got names including Ella Sharp, uh, Sylvia Payne, Barbara Lowe, uh, Karen Stephen who um, were prominent members of the British Psychoanalytical Society who attended the school. Renowned psychologists and psychoanalysts also wrote references and letters in support of the, um, the work permit and um, the painting school, um, which were sent to the British Home Office. So this includes Sigmund Freud, uh, Ernest Jones, and Simmel, Franz Alexander. So on the left, I'm showing you an image, um, copy of the letter that Freud wrote and on the right from um, Ernest Jones. So just to say, I don't think the Seagulls had a close relationship with Freud. Um, Ernestine and Arthur were invited to his um, a party for Freud's 70th birthday in Berlin in 1926, but I don't think that Freud 
knew his work in a huge amount of detail necessarily, but this kind of letter did help the family to secure a permit. And it's part of the process and mechanisms by which they um, established themselves um, in Britain. Now, one thing that I want to mention is that the school forms a particularly close and sustained partnership with an organization called QCAMP. The QCAMP committee included a psychoanalyst called Marjorie Franklin and David Wills, who was a leader in therapeutic care. And in 1936, the Q Camps committee established Hawkesbury Camp in rural Essex, which um, was described, um, and I quote, uh, as a self-governing educational community for young men between the ages of 17 and 25 who do not fit their social environment and may present behaviour difficulties, end quote. So this camp was an experiment into planned environment therapy. And this was a term that was coined and summarised by Franklin as, and again, I quote from Franklin, the effort to study and treat antisocial behaviour and maladaptation by environmental and educational means. So the objective then was to foster responsibility within a community to facilitate democratic decision-making and discipline and help encourage social integration. So to this end, the Hawkesbury camp, um, which I unfortunately don't have any images of today, um, it was a self-functioning structure with shared responsibilities. Um, so members lived in self-erected huts. They were able to develop new buildings, make furniture, look after animals, grow plants, and undertake domestic duties. So the overall regime of Hawkesbury was the predominant instrument of, pre of treatment of therapy, but there were also adjunctive special treatment, which was most typically psych regular psychotherapy. But for some of the young men, their adjunctive treatment was attending um, Seagull's Painting School in London. And there was one man in particular who went regularly for quite a long period of time. And these, the art classes then were considered a form of psychotherapy and a form of treatment. And this begs the question then of how the effects of painting were perceived. And the impact of painting and the art classes was primarily measured in terms of improvements in general disposition, in behavior and overall social adjustment. So for example, the, the teenage boy who attended the most, um, after about three months, David Wills reported, and um, I quote, he said that the young man is much quieter, less inclined to lose his temper. He often spends the evening drawing or painting portraits of people in the camp, and he does so with an air of self-confidence and contentment, which we've never seen in him before." End quote. Um, Franklin kind of makes similar um, claims about the um, effect of attending painting. So she says, marked improvement in all symptoms, became articulate, intelligent in conversation, thoughtful, sensitive, industrious, and much less unstable. So we have to approach these claims um, a bit cautiously. We don't know exactly how the young man might have felt himself about painting, but these accounts do give insight into how art was perceived to operate and show that the effects of painting were observed uh, primarily in psychological and behavioral changes. Now I should emphasize that Arthur was not psychoanalytically or psychiatrically trained. So, Interestingly, his ideas were rooted firmly in a social and pedagogic understanding about the role of art making. So as we've seen, he operated with convictions about the intrinsic value of art. And it's from that perspective as an artist and as an educator that his interest in arts, therapeutic possibilities developed. And this perspective is quite typical of early art therapy in the 1940s as an emerging field. Um, one other thing to, to say about the therapeutic approach is that it was also quite unusual in the sense that it was not about free expression painting or using drawing and painting as a vehicle to articulate inner thoughts or emotions. So as opposed to um, facilitating a, a kind of introspection or employing art as a vehicle for cathartic expression, 
it was about the possible effects of outward facing processes of examining light and creating corresponding forms. Now, in terms of the, the legacy of this work, so today art therapy is an entire professionalized field in which art making is used to help psychologically in a whole range of ways. It developed institutionally and professionally in Britain in the 1950s and 1960s with accredited training courses, national association, and being you know, eventually implemented into the NHS. So the painting school then working in the 1940s is um, really a precursor to this. And it's an early instance of using art therapeutically, which then developed professionally um, in subsequent decades. Uh, now, before I um, come to a close and hand over to John, I want to mention one other uh, really interesting aspect of the school, uh, which is that it ran painting classes for members of the forces between 1942 and 1945 in London and also in Oxford. So these courses then were attended by servicemen and service women. And I should say that these courses were not explicitly for therapeutic purposes. So these weren't for traumatized servicemen, for example, who'd returned from the front line, but it's part of a broader educational program um, for active servicemen and women who were stationed in Britain under the remit of the army education scheme. So I'm showing you here um, one photograph of this on the left and uh, an exhibition catalog here where you can see that it includes work by members of the forces. So here's another image of this which shows three men posed as though in dialogue about their work. So I just want to say that this scheme I think is interesting for um, a few reasons. Um, firstly, in 1940, Arthur, like many other refugees, was interned by the British government as an enemy alien on the Isle of Wight, mm. Isle of Man, sorry. So the archive shows that Ernest kind of tirelessly worked to try and get him released, particularly as he was suffering from ill health, and then eventually he was um, released after two months. And so I think the fact that a couple of years later he was allowed to teach members of the forces shows that he was no longer considered um, to pose a threat um, by the British government. And so here's another image, this time of Marianne um, providing an explanation or demonstration to um, a small group of students. Um, one of the reasons I think this scheme is interesting is because army education in Britain was a really contentious social and political issue. So just in brief, um, progressive left-wing civilian organizations like the WEA had driven and pushed for education for members of the forces before the outbreak of war, viewing education as essential to society. Whereas the views during the war of the war office and certain aspects of the army were that um, education should primarily contribute to military duties. So there's a debate going on about the general purpose of education for the forces. Um, but interestingly, there were also concerns within um, fractions of the army and the war office and also amongst um, MPs about what they saw as potentially subversive forms of education. So there were concerns about lectures, discussion groups, potentially, potentially, potentially leading to subord insubordination. And what they're particularly worried about is the spread of socialist politics. So going back to the Seagulls Painting School then, I think the very fact that Ernestine's proposal was accepted mm. and the um, school was able to teach painting up until and after the end of the war implies that there was a kind of um, progressive and liberal agenda within the army education scheme. But I also think the fact that they were painting seemingly innocuous subjects like mainly clothed female figures, still lives, rather than allowing a kind of open free expression probably meant that the course wasn't seen as uh, particularly political or subversive or threatening and so was um, permitted to continue. So just to kind of wrap up and move towards a conclusion and the kind of key points um, of this talk, it's clear from the archive material that it wasn't very easy um, for the family as refugees in Britain, they struggled financially but they did make long-standing partnerships and impacted on those that they worked with. So Ernestine worked hard to secure a legacy for the school and for Arthur as an artist. I think it's fair to say that the school uh, 
wasn't the most radical avant-garde school with big canonical artists attached to it. Oh, and moved away from what is now um, considered the more explicitly modernist tendencies, but it advanced the social and pedagogic agenda. The family's network extended into the fields of education and therapeutic care. And the idea of teaching students painting therapeutically was new and emerging at this time. And they were obviously kind of involved in this. So in this sense, I think the school belongs to some of the more overlooked narratives in art history, um, which is something that I'm trying to address in, in my wider work. Um, so thank you very much. And I'll, I'll hand back to, um, to Monica now. Thank you very much indeed, Imogen. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, good. I think probably I've, there's some questions coming in already, but I think um, for reasons of time, let's um, hand over to John and then uh, hopefully there will be indeed time for discussion at the end. John, are you ready to screen share? You'll, you'll need to unmute yourself, John. It worked before, I'm sure it'll work again. <laughs> Very good. So John, are, are you unmuted Sorry. now? There we are. Lovely, very good. How are we doing? Yes, all, all good. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try to talk just about uh, my grandfather's life and show pictures uh, of him. Uh, dealing really from his beginnings and not uh, talking about the London period particularly. Uh, but first, this is me uh, painting in the painting school on a Sunday uh, in the 1950s uh, with my Aunt Marianne as the teacher. Um, so let me just see if I can do the next one. The Freud letter we've already seen. Uh, so, yes, I wanted to start like this. Uh, when my grandfather died in Bells in Park in 1944, he'd felt as an artist unknown, eclipsed and forgotten. In this respect, and by contrast, my father, Walter's life ended very differently. He died in 1985, having received much acclaim for the work of his last years. For my grandfather, even later on, in the, in the mid-1950s, Harry Fisher, the co-founder of the Marlborough Art Gallery, came to see the paintings. He, decided, he declined to take an interest. Uh, my, my grandmother worked tirelessly in these years to promote Arthur and also the painting school. Uh, and she produced several pamphlets. You've already seen some uh, that showed. Uh, and she translated some of his writings. Uh, and this is one of my grandmother's pamphlets. All these were all kind of apparently published by the painting school in Hampstead. Uh, but my, so and it, again, for professionals and non professionals, that was their, their theme. But my grandma's English wasn't good enough and she didn't have the background and connections to get things going for my grandfather. She staged three one-man exhibitions of his work, but without much effect. She died in 1967. It was only later in the 1960s when two or three paintings uh, of my grandfather's came up in Sotheby's that serious interest in Arthur Siegel's work began in the UK. This was reinforced by a larger scale uh, and one man catalogue uh, made by Sotheby's in 1970s. Let me just go to a blank here. Um, th there were reasons for my grandfather's obscurity in these post-war years. The first was, of course, the destruction of the avant-garde of avant mod modernism in Germany and his departure into exile in 1933. Then there was the only slow recognition in the UK of the significance of the modern German art movement. And lastly, and most significantly, 
was the fact that my grandpa decided to abandon modern painting for what he called a new naturalism, uh, actually in the late 20s. My understanding is that he used this term, uh, a new naturalism, to focus on the role of light and how it falls on subject and how it changes what we see and how our, our eyes perceive things. My grandfather was a small light in a time of stars, but over the years till now, this, this light has uh, been burning ever more brightly and his place amongst his contemporaries has become now more solidly established uh, and his paintings are found all around the world. My grandparents had little experience of business and Arthur never, never had a promoter or a Karl Weiler or a Flechtheim. Uh, although he was much respected and written about by the art historian critic Adolf Boehner, when Arthur decided to depart from modern painting, Boehner found this difficult and his support waned. However, many of his contemporaries and his students loved his work, and he was also clearly a warm uh, and genial pers person. Thereby, he seems to have had a remarkable ability to get people to support him financially often in exchange for paintings. In Berlin, there was a Dr. Vogel. In Ascona, during World War I, and for years thereafter, there was uh, the anarchist business Bernard Meyer. Uh, and in London, there was the fascinating Wim van Leer, scion of the Dutch Jewish industrial family van Leer, who said he put Arthur on the payroll of his engineering company. In all, it seems that the two Van Leer brothers took some 40 paintings from Arthur Siegel. Father and grandfather chose occupations when they were very young that fortuitously enabled them to work independently and alone. They both gladly accepted their very modest and precarious livelihoods in order to be able to follow their own paths and calling. My in particular, led a very hand-to-mouth existence. Though he was helped by his parents uh, in his youth, Arthur was very poor all his adult life, and like my father too, he had virtually no possessions. Finally, my grandmother, Ernestine, was always the one who held things. She was the great organizer. She wrote of herself, organizer, but not entrepreneur. Arthur Siegel's school uh, was never large, but after he died, she as organizer and my aunt Marianne as teacher built the school in England's lane, uh, up to a, a much more substantial going concern. It then counted Vera Lynn and the Grade brothers amongst its pupils. Now, my grandfather was born in 1875 in Yash, in Moldavia, now northeastern Romania. He grew up in a, in a nearby town of Botol Shan. His parents were members of large Jewish families involved in commerce. Arthur was disinterested and bad at school, and in his teens, he was taken uh, into the family business against his will. This did not work out well, and after being arrested in a local uh, demonstration, his parents finally agreed to help him to study painting. He had already become totally obsessed with painting and said it was all he wanted to do. This enthusiasm and his need to paint never left him. And in his last years, he said he found painting also to be At the age of 17, he traveled to Berlin to study art under the romantic painter Eugen Brach at the Berlin Academy. Uh, yes, I've got um, that sort of an age. He continued his studies in Munich, and after a stay in Paris and Italy, he returned to Munich and lived there until 1903. This is him painting 
uh, in the late 1900s. Uh, at this time, my grandmother arrived in Berlin with her family, who also emigrated from Moldavia. She and Arthur were cousins. She started writing to him in Munich, and in the end, he moved back to Berlin, and they were married in 1904. My father, uh, Walter, in 1907, and Marianne in 1908. These were, these were years, when, years when the new order, I don't know what's happening here. These were years uh, when the new order, expression attraction, was struggling for acceptance from the art establishment. It was also a time when art was painting largely in an expressionist style. He was clearly trying to find his own ways and forms, uh, and he was beginning to be able to exhibit his work. Uh, and this, and, and that is to get accepted exhibitions, and he became known a little. So these are early, these are the expressionist paintings he did before the First World War, sort of between 1900 and World War I. So, this is uh, the orator, uh, and this is my grandmother uh, writing. Uh, as World War I began, things shut down, and Arthur and family moved to Ascona on Lago Maggiore in Switzerland in 1914. It was a refuge from the war and attracted other artists as Uh, I should say, as well as writers, intellectuals, frequent, free thinkers, and as a broad term, cranks. In 1900, Henry Udenkoven, the son of an industrialist from Antwerp, and his wife Ida Hoffman had established a commune they called Monte Verita, Mountain of Truth, on the top of the hill that rises up from Ascona and the lake. And this attracted all sorts of people to stay or visit. Names from Isadora Duncan to Hermann Hesse, Carl Jung, Rudolf Steiner to Paul Clay, Jean Arp, Hans Arp to Kropotkin, and perhaps even Lenin had been there. And the commune is also famous for dance with Rudolf von Laban and his pupil Mary Widman. She was supposed later to have influenced Martha Graham. Arthur and Ernestine knew many of these people. The Siegel family shared a house with the Dutch artists Otto and Adia van Rees. And can you all hear me? I don't know if this is all right. It, it's fine, John. It's a little muffled, but I think we have to live with oh, it. Maybe I got the yes, maybe it's I really interesting. Maybe I haven't got the setting. Uh, is it on, on the setting we had when we started out? It should be. Yeah, I'm sorry. I need to just. Can you hear me better now? Is that any better? Uh, much the same. C c carry on. It's, it's okay. Let me just try. Yes, I, th I think yeah. that's better, John. That is better. Is it's it? Okay. perfect. I'm sorry about that. Just, uh, okay. Where was I? Uh, the Siegel family shared a house with a Dutch artist, uh, Otto and Adia van and their children. It was part of the way up the hill to the commune and just outside Ascona. In Ascona, they knew other artists and intellectuals like Alexei and the curious Heinrich Gersh. Uh, I won't go into that. Uh, my father's family were Jewish by origin, but they all had no religion. In fact, Arthur painted many Christian subjects and was criticized by people within the fold for doing so. In fact, uh, he was commissioned to paint the frescoes on the Catholic cemetery building in Ascona. They're still... Arthur knew Hugo Ball and the Dada people, Arp, Teuber, Zara, Yanko, and others in Zurich. 
and he exhibited with them in the Cabaret Voltaire. He was close friends with Jean or Hans Arp, who used to visit the family in Ascona, as did Salomon Friedland. Sorry, I just need a drink. As did Salomon Friedlander, who wrote under the name Minona, which is anonym backwards, the philosopher and author who was Arthur's great friend. He's, it, it seems that around this time, Arthur got to know Raoul Hausmann, with whom he was friends, the founder of Berlin Dada, and also Hannah Hoch, and also Kurt Schwitters. My grandmother, Ernestine, always skeptical about some aspects of modern art, didn't think much of color. Uh, she thought anyone, even a child, could do one. In fact, to prove it, she got her children to have a go. This is my father's effort, Walter's effort, age 11 in 1918. Oops. Just trying to can't think of the mouse there we are. Uh, the, Asc the Ascona years seemed to have been transformative for Arthur. He began to find his own themes and started to paint the equivalence uh, or equibalance paintings. The, uh, the initial idea being that each part of the canvas was given equal weighting visually. Initially, they were they were strictly uh, a grid of equal sized squares, and then they morphed and morphed again. This is, this is uh, actually, as I said, these were Ascona paintings. This is uh, red houses in Rome, which is a, a small place near Ascona. Uh, and uh, he, also extend, extended the painting onto the cam, onto the frame. These paintings and the way we, they morphed into the 1920s have also been called a form of cube. He also started the storytelling pictures. Oh, it's another scene. God, I'm having trouble with my mouse. There we are. Uh, there are quite a number of these, also a kind of divided canvas. This is called, this is really a day out, and you can see the family uh, and the dog, and they're going out somewhere, and the parents are, are sleeping, uh, and the son is uh, fishing, then it starts to rain, and anyway, then they walk home. Uh, uh, the third modernist theme, the prismatic painting, later in the 20s. Uh, in, in 1918, the, the family planned to return to Berlin, but this was not possible. I was told that Arthur, still a Romanian then, became stateless in 1916 when he did not respond to military call-ups. Bernard Meyer, the patron I mentioned at the beginning, uh, lent him the, uh, the family, lent the family a house in Mutton near Interlaken, and the family lived there so that my father, Walter, could start secondary school. In 1920, the Seagulls moved back to Berlin. And at this time, Arthur and Walter were apparently still officially of Romanian nationality. The 20s seemed to be when Arthur became most confident as a modern painter. And there are many large canvases. And the paintings of this time are the most sought after today. Uh, in the early 20s came the prismatic style of painting. These are largely pointless paintings. Here are some. This is a newsstand in German, in Berlin. This is a still life. This is a, fisher, a fisherman's house, getting more abstract. And these are people in motion. 
Jesus my Christ. The equivalent paintings uh, became less uh, defined. Oh, I'm not quite sure what that was. No, I've got a blank. Yeah, sorry. The equivalence painted became less defined as a rigid grid of squares, uh, and they also moved towards abstraction. This is a self-portrait, uh, still quite fit, obviously a figurative painting, but much more fluid in, in many ways. Um, Arthur, Arthur was encouraged by contemporaries to explore ab abstract art. Uh, So this is getting towards abstraction. And this is the, another uh, style group using narrow lines of color. And this one is, is an abstract painting. But he found himself balking at abstract work. And perhaps this extreme of abstraction started in his mind his rejection of the non-figurative. This is a, a picture of Arthur in the 20s with his pupil Nicholas Brown, with whom he published a book called The Life Problem. Uh, as I said before, he had this great interest in life and it, it's what became his, his way of thinking about naturalism later on. Arthur exhibited with the November Group, for which he was the ex exhibition director, and he had several one-man shows. He found himself in the middle of the modern movement of art and architecture, knowing some of the now famous names. Here are just a few. Van Duisburg, Oud, Mendelssohn, Gropius, Nolder, Art, Hausmann, Kandinsky, Elizitsky, Kokoschka, Feininger, Schmidt, Rolf, Lester, Uri, Hannah Hoch, Sophie Teuber, Mariana, Mariam von Verefkin, and Kate Kolbitz. My mother used to have an open house do, a jour fix, every month where my father, as an adolescent, came <coughs> into contact with these people. In the late 20s, Arthur started to leave modern painting. This is when he was thinking about his new naturalism. He started to explore his viewpoint or focus paintings. This was what the eye actually perceives. This was about what the eye actually perceives. The viewpoint is the focus and everything else blurred. This is uh, a still life and the cup is in focus. Uh, this is, sorry, a bad picture. This is an interior, the chair and the cushion are in focus, not anything else. And here the lamp is, is the main thing. In 1933, as the Nazi regime started to persecute the German Jewish population and it banned modern art, the family up sticks again, this time to Mallorca. Later, in 1934, they got a, lot, a letter from the Berlin police to Mallorca, telling them that their naturalization to German citizenship, that is from Romanian citizenship, had been rescinded. So they were all formally stateless. The, the Mallorca move was perhaps not the greatest in view of the oncoming civil war, but in fact, maybe because of his play with the bright light of the Balearics, uh, Arthur was motivated uh, to paint some of his finest naturalistic paintings. This is Dea, uh, where Robert Graves lived in uh, viewed from a window. Oops, I think I've done one. These are oranges strewn on a table cloth. 
with the light giving big, the big shadows. And these are marguerites. In a veil. These are sunflowers in the vase. And this is a self-portrait with hat. In 1936, my father had already arrived in London from where he'd been employed as a tomb surveyor. He once told me he arrived at the end of 1935. He had discovered he had discovered that he had discovered that the famous battle cruiser, the Hood, later sunk by the Bismarck, was going around the Spanish islands, evacuating British expats. He lobbied his, own, his local MP who managed to get the family authorized to board. And so Arthur and Ernestine made their fifth and final country to country move and landed with Marianne in Folkestone. This is Arthur's, uh, this is Arthur's German passport. Uh, and it shows uh, adjacent pages which track his leaving Germany and arriving in the UK. On the right is the German exit of 1933, May 1933, and on the left is the permission to land in Folkestone uh, up from Spain, from Mallorca, in 1936. These years in the late 1930s in London were very hard for both my father and Arthur and family. Things, things did, however, get a little easier when Arthur finally got permission from the authorities to open his painting school. This is my working, it seems also to be a viewpoint painting with the focus being on the ear. Arthur painted many self-portraits in his later years. Clearly he was his own most accessible uh, model. I've shown two already. Uh, here are two more. Oops, I've jumped one. This one is a focus painting looking into the light with his nose and his forehead being the viewpoints. And this is a painting of nine, I believe. Uh, yes, as, as Imogen said, Arthur was apparently interned briefly on the Isle of Man uh, and then released on compassionate grounds due to ill health. But I don't know much about this. He only lived in the UK. This is Arthur in the UK, another picture of him. Uh, and this is a London street scene in fog, which is also a viewpoint painting focusing on the lamppost. Finally, oops, this is uh, the catalogue cover of a major retrospective in 1987 by the Kölnischer Kunstverein, which showed, which the, the exhibition showed in Cologne and in, Us, in Ascona, but for which funding couldn't be found uh, for it to come to the UK. That's me done. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, John. That provided a perfect counterpart to uh, uh, Imogen's talk. I'm sure everybody will agree. If you could just stop screen sharing, I can see one person oh, yes, sorry, clapping. Yes, do do stop that. I'm not very good at doing this. I'm sorry. <laughs> and what I want to do now is spotlight the two of you. Spotlight for everyone. Imogen, where have you gone? Um, 
Let me find Imogen, there we go. Um, lovely, I've noticed lots of interesting questions coming in. There we are, so everybody hopefully will be able to focus on, on, on the two of you. Um, good, fine, so let me, um, without further ado, sort of just scroll through the questions, actually lots of comments as well. The first thing, perhaps I can just start the ball rolling by making an observation, which seems to me profoundly ironic that actually in his um, reversion, if that's the word, to a much more traditional way of making images, he conformed very closely to the Nazi ideal of what art ought to be. And yet, of course, because of his Jewish origins, presumably that was enough to make him entirely a persona non grata and therefore you know, needed to leave. But there's an irony there, isn't there? I don't know whether Imogen you'd like to comment on that. Yeah, no, it's a yeah, really interesting point. And yeah, definitely that kind of shift to, you know, smooth surfaces naturalism is like you said kind of you know ironically in in line with kind of nancy nazi sanctioned art so yeah it's um it is it's, yeah strange irony and also we tend to think um certainly i i am I, yes, I tend to think of the dominant sort of artistic mode of the emigre artists who come to this country as being expressionistic. But of course, Arthur's story tells us like, you know, it's a different story. And I think important to be aware that actually many of them actually were quite uh, strongly traditionalist in the way that they were making art, certainly in the uh, interwar period. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. OK, um, fine. A very um, specific question from John McKean, whom we're going to be hearing from uh, later. How large were the classes in the various uh, geographical locations? Do we know in Berlin, in London, in Oxford? Um, yeah. yeah, sorry, go. Oh, yeah, the, I was just reading the numbers. Yeah, um, I, I haven't seen any pictures that are bigger than about kind of 18 people. Um, so I think it varied. And obviously, in the exhibition catalogues, it brings lots of students together who would have been attending different, um, you know, evening sessions or in the day. But I think it's relatively, I don't think I larger than, than 18 from that period of what I've seen. Um, I'm not sure, John, if you have any more to... what, what, I, what I know is that, that the school in Berlin was small uh, and, and kind of intense. You know, my grandfather seemed to have close contacts with his pupils. Um, and uh, in, some of them became professional painters afterwards. Um, with the army, I don't know, in, in, in Britain, in Oxford, I don't know really how many. I imagine there were quite large numbers. The, the, the classes in, in uh, Hoban were, were, weren't very large where he started the school, but in Ingalls Lane, uh, and certainly after he died with my grandmother, having built the school up so much, um, they, they had a lot of uh, students every week, uh, less in the mornings, Evenings, I think they had as well, had well over thirty people at a time. Uh, yes, you know, well over thirty people at a time, and they had well over a hundred a week. Something I don't know the numbers exactly, but you know, in in England alone. Interesting. Um, a question here. Um doesn't give the person's name. I'm interested in to what extent, how much Arthur's interest in teaching non-professionals alongside professionals was driven by ideology or whether it was also driven by financial necessity, you know, the need to have clients and to earn a living or, or a bit of both. And I suspect the answer is, is precisely that, but I'd love, I wonder if you'd like to comment on, on that. John, I don't, or either of you? What can I say about that? Um, it, it certainly, that, certainly they was, he was struggling all the time to uh, find, uh, you know, find pupils and, and build up the school. Um, uh, uh, you know, I mean, what shall I say? Uh, the school was always quite small. It was always a quite small activity. And of course, the things that Imogen had talked about were all things that, uh, you know, uh, helped get more pupils. Um, but uh, later uh, in England's Lane, after my grandfather died, it, it was largely an amateur school, it was a larger private amateur school with uh, people doing evening classes for, for, for pleasure. So it, it had a very, I think it had a very different character after uh, he had died. Um, 
Ma I should say that Marianne was trained as a dressmaker, actually, uh, and uh, she didn't feel happy doing that. And Arthur took her in, and he taught her to teach the way he the way he taught. Um, and um, you know, when he died, she was very very much able to take over the role of teacher. And and my grandmother, of course, the great organizer, was was always in her element and, and it went on till she died. I mean, it went on beyond her death, but it was all her, her, her work that made it all happen. Was Ernestine also artistically, I mean, what, what, you know, did she have an art background herself or, or was it very- she didn't, have an art, uh, she didn't have an art background. She was surrounded by artists. And I do have one set of things which are curious, which are embroideries. They're all little embroideries and frames that are sort of, I don't know, say, um, something like nine inches square. Um, and uh, they, they, they are reminiscent of things that were going on with my grandfather in Ascona. You know, I mean, they're, they're slightly modernist. Um, yeah. So, but, but really... She had had, she'd had a kind of business background in a way. I mean, she, you know, she'd come from a business fa family. Her father, her father was a, a tobacco merchant, um, and um, she went quite young. She went into, she was trained as a secretary early in in those years, you know, and um, she became a company director secretary. And she said he wanted her to become more entrepreneurial. And she said, I can't do that. I'm, I'm an organizer, not an entrepreneur. And that was her, that was how she saw her life, you know. And uh, she had this, um, she had this great material to try to do something with, you know, all these writings of my grandfather. She produced all these pamphlets. Uh, and, um, you know, she built, I mean, the school provided, I mean, talking about the livelihood, the school provided my Marianne and my auntie and my grandmother um, a, a very good life relatively in, the, in my grandmother's last years, you know. And my aunt had a car. They'd never heard of a car before. You know, my father and grandfather never had a car. Um, so, yeah, my grandmother was quite a character. <laughs> Evidently. Um, um, a comment here from Jan Foreman, just I don't know whether, uh, John, you, you know Jan. Uh, my first art class was at England's Lane. Marianne was my teacher, a lovely lady with a large cat. <laughs> That's a rather delightful yeah. description. <laughs> I can put you two in touch with each other if, if you don't know each other yet. Um, I, should also say, I should also say, by the way, that my grandmother in the school was always called Mad Madam and uh, Marianne always referred to her as madam, you know, so. <laughs> Do you think they resented both Ernestine and Marianne the fact that indeed the school remained named after your grandfather and they got very little credit for its uh, activities and success? Was there any sense of, you know, gender issues? Not at all, not yeah. at all. They loved, my, they loved my grandfather. They were very sad that he had died relatively young. And um, they, my grandmother particularly was, very, um, you know, very motivated to, to try to get my grandfather a uh, what he, she thought was a proper place in in the art of his time, you know. Mm -hmm. Now I'm aware of time rushing on and everybody will need a break if they are planning to join us at eight, but just a few more questions if I may. Um, from Craig Fees, is it? Sorry if I've mispronounced that image and very interesting, thank you. Given the psychotherapists he worked with in Oxford, for example, Sylvia Payne, can we trace his or their influence in post-war psychotherapy and psychoanalytic theory and practice? What's the sort of longer term legacy? Um, yeah, I think the in terms of psych psychoanalysis specifically, it's quite difficult to trace the influence in that field. So you can trace the kind of influence in kind of therapeutic care more broadly. Um, I mean, someone has said to me that in the British Psychoanalytical Society archives, there is something in relation to the painting school, but I haven't had a chance to go and have a look. But I think because um, 
at that time kind of art and psychoanalysis were intersecting but I think because Arthur wasn't so interested in psychoanalytic theory so he used some psychoanalytic terms in the writing but it's clear that the perspective is more um as, you know as an artist and educator so I think although there was interest from psychoanalysts it's less hard to track the influence directly into their subsequent practice that it can be traced in um kind of yeah as a sort of therapeutic care more widely and I know that Ernstine for example gave a paper at an art therapy conference in the 1950s I think so there is a kind of influence beyond it and you know in kind of promoting and generating ideas about the therapeutic function of art but I think it the relationship with psychoanalysis later is maybe less less strong specifically with, with psychoanalysis. Um, about Oxford, I was curious um, to know whether there was any evidence of links with the Slade when it was evacuated from London to Oxford during the war. Are you aware of any links at all? Uh, no, no. No, I'm not either, actually. I Yeah, that's interesting. I have to have, have a look at that. But yeah, well, not... It's worth investigating, because obviously Oxford yeah. is a small, small place. In yeah, yeah. Um, one last question. There are quite a few others and indeed a long comment, but I will actually, I'll send you a transcript of the chat and then if you want to be in touch with any of the commentators, you're very obviously welcome to do so. Um, yes, um, so interesting to focus on light instead of self-expression. I mean, that's a, yeah, really interesting. But then actually a, a bigger question. Uh, do you think it needed refugees from the continent to start art therapy? And if so, why? That's a big, a big question. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm conscious of time. I think, I think, um, yeah, um, yeah. But interestingly, art therapy in Europe develops in Britain earlier than it, far earlier, really, than it does in Germany. And even in Germany today, it's practiced in quite a different way, is my understanding. So I think definitely um, refugees brought ideas that around, um, you know, like Cizek and child art that was kind of fundamental for the development of art therapy in this country. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think so. But art therapy is based on lots of different ideas that come together. Um, but, and yeah, so I'm just my brain's going. In. But yeah, in in short, I think I think I think yes. <laughs> Yes, but it's always a symbiosis, isn't it? It's a coming together, it's to do that cultural and yeah. other kinds of interchange that are so fruitful, indeed. I think we better stop there, but if I can just conclude by kind of perhaps just picking up on a few things for the, for the future. Um, you'll be glad to know, um, everyone, that Imogen will be giving a paper, a short paper, but actually on Arthur Segal as, you know, and his ideas of art as therapy for a two day or two afternoon online conference that Insiders Outsiders is organizing in early December, together with the Research Center for German and Austrian Excel Studies at London University, which will be, we're calling it, what is it? It's Innocence and Experience, and um, the 1930s refugee, or childhood and the 1930s refugees. And Chizek will also come into the story. So if you're interested um, in pursuing that further, do look out uh, for that event. Um, various people have asked about this being recorded. Yes, it has been. I think technology is serving us fine. The recording will be uploaded probably within a week or so, maybe earlier onto the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel, which you can easily find on, um, on uh, the internet. And um, though I say it myself, there's now a really rich kind of selection of recordings of past events that those of you who maybe haven't been familiar with Insiders Outsiders might like to kind of peruse and browse and, and dip into at, at your leisure. Um, if you want to know what's in store, we're going to take a break now over the midsummer, the sort of uh, July, August period, but we're going to resume our activities in September. And if you'd like to be kept abreast of what's in store, I'd urge you to go to the Insiders outsidersfestival.org website and sign up to the newsletter. You can do that if you scroll down to the bottom of right of the homepage, it's very easily uh, done. Um, and yes, there is much in store. Internment is something we had one or two questions about that. Um, this year, as you may know, and indeed last year was the 80th anniversary of that very, very morally murky British wartime episode where Yes, they're called enemy aliens, most of them, in fact, 
refugees from Nazi Europe were interned by the British government, mostly on the Isle of Man. And it's interesting to note, John, you said, I think, or Imogen, that you don't know much about Arthur's time there. I could put you in touch with people on the ground there who might have some you know, archival record of, of his spell there, a very interesting topic. And there is actually going to be a trip to the Isle of Man organized again by Insiders Outsiders in uh, conjunction with Jewish Renaissance magazine for mid-October. So much, much to look forward to, much in store. So it just reminds me, hold on, there are three new messages, probably words of thank. Let me just, indeed. Ah, yes, monograph, okay, yes, quite so. John, you mentioned, I mean, quite shamefully that the exhibition that was shown in Europe didn't ever come to this country. And this is something I've noticed with a number of, you know, lesser known, but really powerful and interesting emigrate artists that there is, you know, ironically, again, irony of ironies, you know, more interest in their work in their countries of origin yeah, as a gesture of redress, perhaps, than there is here. Um, is there any other, is there a monograph in English? Is there any substantial publication of about your grandfather available now? No. No. <laughs> Somebody needs to do something about it quite, <laughs> quite clearly. That's really <laughs> quite shocking, isn't it? Okay. All right. Well, in that sort of negative, but also positive note, because I think, you know, it will come. I think Imogen, you said there is more and more interest. Am I right? And John, likewise. Yes, it's sort of... <laughs> Let's I mean, it, you know, th th it would be nice to have that catalogue mm. translated, actually, or mm. certainly mm. the contributions of some uh, some of the you know the some of the contributors' uh, writings because they are quite interesting things. Mm. People who have now died, actually, you know. So, yes. No, this is certainly something, yes, yeah, somebody, <laughs> Rosemary saying, please, please write one. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> Lovely. And on that note, it just remains for me to thank John and Imogen hugely for their wonderful presentations. As I say, they went wonderfully together, really rich and thought-provoking and, and, and actually beautiful on the eye as well. Uh, many thanks from many people coming in. Uh, so I think it's time to call it a day, to take a breath. I hope to see at least some of you at eight o'clock where the con conversation will continue when we look in detail at, uh, at Walter, at uh, John's father and Arthur's son. Mary Kelly, did you want to say something? I see a hand raised very briefly. No. Okay, I think it's probably time to take a, take a break. Many, many thanks everyone for being a good audience, interesting, interested audience, and I hope to see you again. All the best. Good night. Thanks, Marco. <laughs>